episode 43. 43. Of 43 of the cinema. We are back, man, on something resembling a consistent schedule. It's what? amazing. Yes, I know. It's it's hard to believe, but uh, the the movie show right here on the oh, Bring It Network. Oh, oh, I'm, back. oh, I'm so, so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Um, yes, look at my mean. wrist. I got to go. I got a thing. So, uh, <laughs> yes, we'll that was episode 43 of the cinema. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, you keep threatening anyway. If I've got to go, mm-hmm. do we have somebody else that could slip in? Perhaps someone whose knee holds all the movie knowledge in existence? <laughs> yes, we have Thomas Manning with us today. How you doing what? today, sir? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Always a pleasure to talk movies and anything with y'all. Anything at all for that matter. Life, <laughs> whatever it is, I'm glad to be here and appreciate the invitation. I'm well, glad to have you, man. We are absolutely glad to have you. And you know what? I will stick around because one of these days I'm not going to be available and Daryl's going to make these, quote, jokes that he makes uh, real. And I want to keep my job. Hey, so just I'm say the word. Around. Just say the word, and I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you don't know, Douglas, is we're actually on episode 44 of our secret show we've been doing for quite some what? time. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Man, I would totally listen. Yeah. Somebody yeah. should have told me. That's why your numbers for that secret show are so low. <laughs> <laughs> I can just tell. I can feel it. <laughs> the number one way to cut to a podcaster's heart deep: your numbers are low. <laughs> <laughs> Especially on a show no one knows about. Exactly. So how you doing, Thomas? It's been a minute since uh, you've joined us. In fact, I'd say it's been 10 years. Let's see. I think it was it was March last time that uh, me and Noel were on your show. And that was about a week before the entire world shut down. Mm. So I don't know if our podcast was the catalyst for that. Um, (laughs) And I was talking to Douglas shortly before the show. Maybe this will kind of bring things full circle set the world back on the mend uh one can hope Uh, it's probably not going to happen but one can hope we can put it out into the universe we're not talking about anticipated films anymore because nobody knows the release date so you know maybe we maybe the monkey's paw will relax a little bit yeah 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 Yeah, i mean the world's not going to reset itself to rights with that attitude thomas (laughs) we gotta be we gotta be in the right mind frame this show will heal What's left of 2020? I'm putting it out there in the universe right now. All right. Heal the yeah. world, make it a better place. And like, it was going to, but then, nope, nope. You just <laughs> killed the whole vibe. This is going to ruin 2020 even further. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining, guys. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas, since we last spoke to you, man, uh, you've been in the background hustling and shaking and moving, man, and putting out some stuff. You want to uh, you want to talk about it a little bit there? Wait, excuse me, hold on. We have to we have to set that up because we're talking to executive producer oh, Thomas Manning. Yeah, executive yeah. producer. Executive producer. Thomas Manning just out there having lunch with Jordan Peele and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was supposed to be secret, but since you said it, hey, sorry, I'm sorry uh, for letting. What's it going out. on with Candyman? Give us Candyman. Yeah, give us that Candyman update. But yeah, what you've been working, what you've been working on, man? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, um, I think You're about sure? a month after. <laughs> it's been a lot. It's been a lot that's happened. <laughs> about a month after uh, my March appearance on the Cinnamon, I was officially accepted into North Carolina Film Critics Association. That opened a lot of doors for me, and of course, I'm. Very thankful for all of your support and everything that y'all have given me that have kind of propelled me along that path. So uh, thanks for that. It was definitely um, not Noel. It was us. <laughs> yeah. Up on our yeah. podcast, yeah. you get attention. Yeah. Who, who even is Noel? Like, <laughs> oh, wait, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. This summer, I worked as a production assistant on the Real to Real Film Festival in uh, Kings Mountain, North Carolina, which yeah, was... Did. Happened to be that film fest happened to be like co founded by Noel back in the day. <laughs> so, yeah, I am kind of riding on his coattails a little bit, but you know, just trying to make the most of it. Um, also, during that time, I had a friend who I've known pretty much my whole life from Bowling Springs, North Carolina, and connected is through his Garden name. Road. Also, Noel, uh, no, no, this is a different guy. Uh, Christian Jessup, he graduated from Garner Webb University a few years ago, and I've, I've known him, you know, we go way back. And uh, he had watched the Last Dance docu series on ESPN, uh, the Michael Jordan uh, Chicago Bulls documentary series, and he thought, well, I'd like to make a little documentary, maybe a little ten-minute featurette about Garden Web University's 
first run to the NCAA tournament, uh, March Madness, which back in 2019 was actually my freshman year, and Christian had just graduated the year before. Um, so I'd kind of been involved in all of that. Uh, I was on the camera crew for some of the ESPN Plus that some of the ESPN Plus games that year. Uh, and then, of course, as a freshman student at all the games, uh, having a lot of fun and trying to get involved in as much stuff as possible. Um, and so Christian just reached out. He was like, hey, I'm going to make a 10-minute featurette. Do you have any clips on hand that you maybe shot throughout the week? Any cell phone footage? I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, here's a few things that I have. Um, and then from there, that was probably back in June. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. We uh, talked to some of the coaches, talked to Coach Tim Kraft. Uh, he gave us contact information for a lot of the players. And uh, before too long, we're like, okay, this might be like a feature-length documentary we're going to put together here chronicling the entire season. Um, so basically over the course of a four-month period with a $500 budget um, and only access to players and coaches through Zoom, we were able to put together a feature-length documentary about the Gardner Webb running Bulldogs trip to the NCAA tournament in 2018, 2019 season. Um, so it's not, you know, not highbrow art. It's uh, not something that uh, is, is not ESPN caliber work, but considering working with as uh, working with limited resources that we did have and uh, just how much passion went into it, quite proud of what we were able to put together. It's uh, The Dancing Bulldogs is the title. Uh, the Dancing Bulldogs at 16 Seas Journey to the NCAA Tournament. It is available on YouTube to stream for free. And uh, I just, if anybody gets the chance to watch it, we would greatly appreciate the support. I think we're sitting at about 4,000 views right now. Uh, we got about 3,500 within the first three weeks, and it kind of plateaued. But uh, we've gotten some great responses from the community, from players and coaches, from, you know, from Bowling Springs and Shelby area. So it's just been an awesome experience. And uh, I acted as first assistant director and executive producer. Christian was kind of the mastermind as the director, editor, and composer. He composed an original music score. Um, and then we also had Brendan Boylan as associate producer, Eli Harden as co-writer and co-producer. So a great team of four guys that uh, just got together for a project and learned a ton, had a great experience with it. And uh, we're just really thankful for everything that's that's been provided to us. Through it. So. Are, are you guys going to shop this thing around to any festivals or anything like that? I mean, I know it, it came out when, um, was it, it was October, right? Last yeah. Month? Yeah. Middle of October. Um, okay. we have about a list of a dozen festivals throughout the region that we're going to be submitting it to. I think we've already submitted it to two or three. And, uh, then for others, we're just kind of waiting on those submissions to open up. And um, hopefully we'll get accepted by a few and uh, just see where that takes us. Any, any home release type of opportunities? Are you guys just pulling out a stack of CDRs and making magic? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's see. I think Christian is working on a little something. Uh, maybe a few special edition DVDs to give to those, uh, those that were involved with it, uh, specifically players and coaches. But I don't know if there are any critics out there that want to want to copy. I'm sure we can probably hook them up. So. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it? with the with the five hundred dollar budget, man, and and just a mere couple of months to to throw that thing together, it is an incredibly well produced documentary, man. I was I was engaged and engrossed all throughout. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know if you'd had a chance to watch it yet or not, but uh, oh, I checked it out awesome. a month or so ago. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, that's that's what we love to hear. And uh, Douglas, are we still waiting to hear from you on that? Yes, yes. <laughs> I I have literally no time uh, to wad, add anything else into my schedule. In fact, last night I was supposed to have a night off, and because I've got some FYC stuff going on this weekend, and I was like, okay, if I do that. I want to spend time with the family, so I won't work. And then a package showed up that I had to immediately dive into. So I, I have not had the opportunity, but I plan to. Yeah. And this probably won't sound like a compliment when I say it out loud, so bear with me. But with the inevitable arrival of baby number two, I'm going to stop writing for a while. So I'm planning to use that period to catch up on things. So I very much am intending to watch the Dancing Bulldogs, especially before NCFCA votes 
And considering your film is is one that is uh, very relevant to North Carolina. Yeah. So I will I will not be missing it. You won't get a formal review because you know fine. you're angling for my job on the cinnamon. That's a conflict <laughs> of interest. But I, I very much am intending to watch it. I just literally have not had the opportunity. Here's a question. Since Thomas, you are a contributor to Elements of Madness. Uh have you written a review for the Dancing Bulldogs for Elements of Madness? I wouldn't have accepted it. Wouldn't have accepted it. <laughs> I, I have not, and yeah, I don't plan to. Just you know, for the sake of my own dignity, probably not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to hop in there as guest contributor for uh, for one article, <laughs> Elements of Madness. Boom. We do run video reviews now. We would run an audio review. So, Daryl, if you want to come jump on over to that side of EOM, you are welcome to do so. Hey. Any Far, bit of publicity limited. helps, yeah. So, what was that? Any publicity? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Dancing no Bulldogs. The Dancing Bulldogs. Yeah. Go to YouTube, search in the box, The Dancing Bulldogs. Yeah. Make sure I throw in Paprika as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Good anyway. shit, man. Anyway, uh, Thomas, what... It's, it's like I said, it's been a while since you've been on, man. What, uh, what kind of films you've been checking out lately? What you've been watching that's been catching your interest the last month or so that's, that's worth checking, or a couple months that's worth mentioning to the peoples out there? Let's see. Um, so this past week, got a batch of FYC screeners from Netflix. Uh, Ooh, so pretty fancy. cool. Like, yeah, at uh, this point in my life to be getting some of those. I think, um, Daryl, I saw you got the same package, and it just feels pretty cool to see your name on a package from Netflix. Um, so the one I checked out, uh, Dick Johnson is Dead, a documentary that actually won Best Feature Documentary and uh, Best Director of the Critics' Voice Documentary Awards just Dick. last week. Um, Dick Johnson. What I say? Dave. Did I say Dave? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Dick, Dick Johnson is Dead. That's it. Yo, That's it. when I looked for it on Netflix, I also typed Dave Johnson. <laughs> Who is Dave Johnson? <laughs> and is he okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I thoroughly appreciated this one. Um, it's, you know, part documentary, part real life fantasy. Uh, it's really hard to explain to someone who doesn't know the premise, but I would say actually going into it without knowing the premise could give you the most interesting experience with it. Uh, so this man, Dick Johnson, is an elderly man with dementia. He's approaching the end of his life. Uh, but his daughter, uh, Kirsten Johnson, the director, kind of wants to approach this pretty dark period of, as he faces his own mortality with a very uh, dark comedic perspective. Um, you know, she is like, she's laying out ways in which he could, quote, accidentally die, um, bringing in stunt coordinators and makeup artists. And she's Squid kind packs. of directing, yeah, directing behind the scenes. Um, and you have, you know, there's one time where he is walking down the street and the AC unit falls on his head from a window. <laughs> oh, whoops. There he is. There he goes. Uh, another time where he falls down the stairs and his legs are bent. Every <laughs> which way. Oh, whoops. There he goes. But what's really, really beautiful about it is um, Dick Johnson himself is such a good sport about it and is fully on board with the whole process. And um, it's, what this documentary shows about the impact of one individual's life on the people around him, those who he loves and those who love him. It's a, uh, it's just really, really lovely to see. And um, especially considering that he is not mentally where he used to be, um, that he's still able to find this much joy in such a dark period of his life and of the end of his life. Um, it, it, was, it was quite a moving story. Uh, brought me to tears a few times. I was laughing, laughing out loud multiple times as well. And uh, when it's a documentary that's able to weave all of that together, uh, you know, quite impressed with it. But, right on, right on. It's actually uh, one. It was nominated for a few awards for the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards, and I believe won Best Film and Director. I don't yeah. remember if it won anything else, yeah. but it did win for those, and it's well deserved. It's well deserved. Have you seen it yet, Daryl? Uh, it's one I'm about halfway through now. I had to uh, I had to stop it because yours truly was at work at 3 a.m. this morning. So I was like, I got to get in bed. Yeah. Uh, I, from what I've seen so far, man, I've I've really really been enjoying it. Um, it it's it's weird hit getting you in the heart later. Oh, I'm sure it will. It's weird getting a a. I haven't gotten discs from Netflix in years. 
<laughs> uh, it's a different kind of disc too. This kind of disc, yeah. I was like, wow, this is this is unexpected. And then I fired it up on my PlayStation. But yeah, it's uh, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's it's so far I'm I'm in for it. At first I was like, nah, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'll probably finish that up this evening. Have you seen anything else, Thomas? That's worth mentioning. Oh uh, yeah, I watched the uh, personal history of David Copperfield. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh really? Was, that's that's my number one thing for this evening. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Armando Iannucci directed. Uh, he did Death of Stalin. He's done Veep on a uh, I think it's HBO or Showtime. And um, of course, you got Dev Patel, Daryl. I know he's he's the star of one of your most anticipated films coming up, which we may or may not see, uh, The Green Knight. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sore yeah, spot. But, but yeah, yeah, this um, adapted from a Charles Dickens novel, personal history of David Copperfield, just extremely charismatic and charming from start to finish. Um, great cast. I think it was nominated for a BAFTA for best casting. You have, um, you have Deb Patel, you have Hugh Laurie, Tilda Swinton, um, Peter Capaldi, Ben Whishaw, great, great ensemble. And um, love the school. Ben, ben Wishaw is so freaking creepy in that movie, <laughs> dude. I fucks with Ben Wishaw oh, hard. I oh, love that love guy. This, I yeah, love that yeah. guy. Yeah, I mean, All he's right. he's he's like a lizard in this movie. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is an excellent description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But um, as a period piece, of course, the sets, the costumes are beautiful. Um, I would probably see it getting some Oscar buzz in those categories. The score from a uh, Christopher Willis, I believe. Uh, just absolutely beautiful and um, just kind of fills you with warm, fuzzy feelings all the time you're watching. Uh, great story, great uh, character art for this, this man that really has to come from nothing, has to overcome obstacle after obstacle, and eventually um, finds his place by telling the stories of his own life in a, uh, in a roundabout way, uh, especially an ode to the... Um, Ode to the artistic process and where we get inspiration from with our art, with our storytelling, and for him, it happens to be from his own life and telling those stories in a uh, in a different fashion. And uh, I just really thoroughly appreciated watching this one. And uh, if only the screener link had not buffered so much, <laughs> uh, uh, pro- probably could have settled into a lot more to it. Uh, but I think uh, upon rewatch with maybe on a Blu-ray, I could have really fully appreciate everything has to offer just curious thomas um and daryl i forget if if you've seen this as well have have y'all seen tesla by any chance the ethan hawk movie no no it was one that i was like this can be back burner for a bit okay i, I was in the room while uh, noel was watching the screener but um that's <laughs> you were in the room <laughs> i mean paying attention at all uh not really i was i was working on some other stuff so that's fair that's fair the reason why I ask is there's a lot about the personal history of David Copperfield that made me think of the best elements of Tesla mm. and how Tesla with, uh, with Ethan Hawke, it, there were elements that made it look like it was part of a stage play and that what was happening in the present was also mixing with the future and sort of these different elements that were really, really fascinating in, in almost a steampunk kind of way. And what I really liked about the personal history of David Copperfield is that the cast is just a great cast. It's interracial, international, intercultural. It has no bearing necessarily on the story. It's just great actors. But also that it sort of also used that here we're going to be on a stage. This is how we're beginning the story. And Dev is coming in and out of the screen as different historical moments in his life are happening. And it was just a really interesting way to frame the story that personally I felt added some wonderful energy to, to the storytelling. So uh, uh, from the nod of your head, I take it, Thomas, you agree, but Daryl has no idea because he has seen neither of these films. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one man that I'm embarrassed to say. Don't be embarrassed. I'm like, oh man, I need to check out the personal co- uh, personal history of David Copperfield. And then like a day or two goes by and Leslie's like, don't you need to watch David Copperfield? I'm like, oh shit, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was like last last night. I was like, oh, I got time to watch one day before I get in bed. And Leslie's like, shouldn't you watch? And I was like, I have that, don't I? So it is written down on a piece of paper. 
watch Dave Copperfield. <laughs> so I know that when I uh, when I get back from running my errands today, it is number one on my list of things to do. Right on. After after finishing Dick Johnson. Uh, Dick Johnson is dead, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thomas, do you have anything else you want to add or let's see. Uh those are the two I'll... big ones. Yeah, those, those are two big ones. I did watch, of course, a Borat subsequent movie film a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you've already discussed this one or not on uh, any no, other I podcast. Really no. But, uh, yeah, um, there's nothing, really nothing left for me to say that hasn't already been said about it. But it is uh, – it's, <laughs> it's – it just reveals everything that uh, we've – pretty much everything we've already known about the underbelly of the United States um, that's kind of – been bubbling to the surface more and more over the past four years and um this really shines a light on just how deep it goes it's uh it's hilarious but also quite frightening and terrifying um just um the systemic corruption and bigotry that goes to the highest of levels everywhere you look in our country and in our society but uh sasha baron cohen is a true genius um and also along what's her name uh maria bakalova who steals acts, the whole movie yes acts as a uh, borat's daughter in this film um she i mean it's one of the greatest comedic performances i've seen in quite some time and um yeah i think really it was her movie more than borat's and mm-hmm. borat was just a supporting figure and she was what really drove it forward um and um i'm I'm glad we got to see this film kind of to kick off. It was probably about a week before the election when it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> with uh, what we've seen from uh, Rudy Giuliani over the past month or so. An epic run. <laughs> An epic run, man. Th- this is this, uh, you know, Borat subsequent movie film kind of kicked it off for him. So, you know, not, not a, not a, um, not a flattering shout out to Rudy, but, uh, one nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. One nonetheless, man, I haven't seen a meltdown this bad since me and Korea in 2005. <laughs> yeah, man. It's uh that, I, that's one that I heard about it and I was like, do we really need another one of these? And apparently we did because it's from what I've heard, it's just as, just as fresh and innovative and original and nobody shines that light on the the CD underbelly of the U.S. kind of like he does. Like investigative journalism is one thing, but the, the he really just puts it right in your fucking face. Exactly, yeah. unflinchingly. I I haven't seen the first one. I wasn't. I, I I never really got into Cohen's comedy, and and never really. Like Bruno and uh, Ali G, I just it, it was never amusing to me or, or interesting, so I never checked out Borat. And then, of course, finding out that my hometown is featured, there's apparently a sequence in the first film at a rodeo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's in if I remember correctly, that's in Roanoke, Virginia. A friend of mine was actually there. I don't think she was on camera, but she was there when it when it happened. But just with those two things, I was like, I'm good. I don't need to know that or get confirmed that my hometown is a little racist. I mean, my temple, the temple I went to as a kid did get desecrated several times. So I already knew it, (laughs) but uh, watching this one, it definitely was not what I expected from it, having heard what I did. But then again, Sasha's become so popular. They make a point in Borat too, to show you people know who he is. You see Borat and people were chasing him down. So using uh, Maria was probably the best thing that they could do because uh, Bakalova could get into places he can't anymore. And yeah, so it was really more her story. And there appeared to be more of a narrative uh, than, than the first one perhaps had. Uh, at least that's what I've, that's sort of what people have suggested to me. I thought Borat too was fine. She was amazing. I want to see more of her. Just as an actor, I want to see more of her. She, she definitely walked away with that movie, which is hard to do from Cohen because you see something like Trial of the Chicago 7 and he's phenomenal in that. Edic actors, man. They know what they're doing when it comes to drama. You know? Look at Robin Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Daryl, you, um, you got anything you want to mention before we slide on into our topic? Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, young Thomas talked about uh, Dick Johnson is dead, of that Netflix package, I decided to sit down and watch The Social Dilemma. 
uh, that also came in that same package. The uh, the docudrama about uh, the rise of social media, what it's done to society, uh, and how it's affected, influenced things. Uh, Jeff Orlowski directed this bad boy. Um, features a couple of different people in who were formerly parts of the tech community, uh, be it Google or be it Instagram, be it um, Facebook, Twitter, and shows just how manipulated people have become through the use of social media, um, mm -hmm. how they all are just equally fighting for your attention. What can they do to get your attention? That part, absolutely fascinating. The fact that they try to take that and give it a quote unquote practical application by also having this interstitial narrative of a young influenced teen, probably like maybe 15, 16, something like that, as they they talk about, hey, these are the things that social media is doing to you. And they kind of have this narrative of you see it being done to this kid. That part, not as good. Um, I wish they just stuck to the experts talking about the manipulation, um, what they've seen, how they helped propagate it, how they felt about it afterwards, what they've done to combat it. That is the more interesting part. And the further it goes on, the, the more and more time you spend with this this narrative of this kid being influenced by the whole thing. And it kind of falls together in the end. Uh, but still worth checking out, though. Worth checking out. It, it gives you something to chew on afterwards, which is what any good documentary should do, is give you a little something to think and reflect on afterwards. Like, maybe I could have been part of the Dancing Bulldogs back in the day. I could have. Yeah. My three-point shot is nice. Uh, but, yeah, that that's just that, that inserting that narrative really – is really just like the sand in my craw for that because it had the potential just being great and informative and it's kind of ruined by that narrative i also saw palm springs which doug talked about a long time ago eight years ago earlier this year on cinema he talked about it feels like yesterday feels like and then it felt like yesterday and then it felt like yesterday <laughs> uh, directed by max barbacal I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Andy Sandberg, uh, Akiva Schaefer produced this because that's what they do. That's their wheelhouse. Uh, Kristen Melody, Meloshi, is your uh, your your main actress playing opposite of Andy Sandberg. You know, Hulu original, but a guy who is stuck in a a day loop, and we've seen this a million times, right? That's the whole purpose of Groundhog's Day and this and that. But uh, they go a different route with this. A uh, Actually, I prefer this to Groundhog's Day, honestly. Uh, this, the, the, the apathy that Sam Burke has fallen into versus the determination that Kristen Melosi has in this movie is, I think, the driving force. That's what makes this interesting to me. A guy who's like, hey, I'm stuck in a time loop. It is what it is. and really hasn't done anything to... Well, we, we were told that he's tried different ways to get him, but he's just settled into apathy. This is what my life is now versus someone who's like, no, I refuse to accept these circumstances. Uh, I think the play back and forth between, between those characters is great. I think the direction is great as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think Kristen Melody is the best thing that comes out of this movie because she is very much, fuck that, we're not settling for this. And she embodies that character and goes all in for it. J.K. Simmons, for the little bit of time that he pops up in there as well, is, uh, is excellent. Like his tempo is wonderful. His <laughs> tempo rhythm. is wonderful. Uh, in my head, this crazy-ass J.K. Simmons is J.K. Simmons in real life. Like, that's, just, <laughs> that's how I think about it. And I thought that before I saw this movie. And I was like, ah, confirmed. But it's one. Uh, it's on Hulu. It's definitely worth checking out. It's a. It's a nice subversion to the, to the, time travel repeating day genre. It's a fresh injection into what that subgenre needs. Right on. Right so on. definitely worth checking out. And I also checked out a movie I was so hyped about this year, The Burnt Orange Heresy, Ooh. and it does not deliver, unfortunately. Uh, oof, man. I'm going to give this name a go as to who directed it. Uh, sorry in advance. It directed by Giuseppe Capot Capotondi. I first thought uh, you were saying that uh, sorry in advance was his name, but. <laughs> <laughs> if, that so was his, here. if that was his name, that would make this movie make so much more sense. <laughs> um, the Burnt Orange series. It's yeah. It came out. 2000, 
nine ish back in Italy, 2020 here. Um, Elizabeth Debicki, who is quickly becoming one of my favorite actresses, and Klaus Bang as well, and Mick Jagger, Donald Sutherland. This cast, I was like, okay, I'm kind of in for this. And it's like a, a crime thriller art thief type movie. I'm like, we haven't got one of those since like Thomas Crown Affair, I guess, would be the last time you had like some art heist shit go down. So I was, that I can think of, I was all on board with this. Um, and even the premise, the premise is good. And you had a guy who's been kind of grifting the art community as a as a art critic who's not really quite as good as he says he is uh, gets into this fling uh Klaus Bang gets into this fling with Elizabeth Debicki who comes to one of his shows uh he as an art critic is invited to Mick Jagger's house super rich Mick Jagger uh on his estate lives Donald Sutherland Jerome Debney who is like esteemed world-renowned artist who will not sell any of his artwork. And Mick Jagger, who also loves art and has all the money in the world, but does not have one of those art pieces, is like, I want you guys to steal me one of those art pieces. And that's kind of what this movie is about, or wants Klaus Bang's character to steal him one of those art pieces. And, uh, and that's like your first act right there. And then you're off to the races with how this whole thing plays out. And you get some great interplay between Debicki and Donald Sutherland. Uh, Mick Jagger, who just... From what I've heard, when he's in the movie, he's in there for like three minutes most of the time, and he knocks it out of the park, and that's exactly what he does here. And he might have a total of eight, ten minutes of screen time here, and he makes the most of this movie, uh, of, of his time that he's got in this movie, uh, especially towards the end when uh, he's just such a smug prick. Uh, the, the, the interaction between Kyle's Bay and Elizabeth Debicki is pretty good. The acting is fairly decent, but the story is fairly thin it doesn't quite hold up for me um i feel like they uh they 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 shot their they shot their whole load on cinematography and directing and forgot that you actually have to have a story to wrap around those bones to make something meaty and they do not do that here it comes off as fairly thin fairly uninspired um so yeah check it out if you want to would be my glowing recommendation of that movie yeah, I, I was doing a quick search. It looks like the last thing he did that he acted in was the Man from Elysian Fields in 2001. Otherwise, he's been mostly doing uh, Rolling Stones related stuff. Interesting. He just, I mean, the man doesn't really have to work. Not yeah, there's also work. that. There's also that. I feel like there's something that might come across his desk and he's like, yeah, why not? Oh, wait. Nope. Here he did the bank job, he was uncredited. As a bank employee. That's the Jason Statham joint, right? Let me see. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw was that. I curious about but never saw. Oh, uh, yeah, I remember watching that. It was like 09, 08, yeah. I think yeah. I saw it in 09. Um, fairly decent, man. Fairly decent. I mean, it's what you expect out of a heist movie starring Jason Statham. What you think it is, that's what that movie is. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. It's him saying, oi, a lot. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the end. But, but not yeah. with a Y, like he's, you know, Jewish. It's with an I because he's, what, English, Welsh? English of some kind, right? That's a good question. I think. I think yeah, Welsh. Yeah, yeah. He's from Shirebrook, Derbyshire, England, which I just assume is super English. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Doug? What have you seen? Um, well, just because I want to, I really want to get to the to the meat of our episode. Yeah, meet it uh, up. There, there are two things I want to mention. One is a film that comes available on Shudder. It's, it did some festival releases, and I don't know if it has a physical release in the U.S. right now, but it's a movie that, by the sheer name, is going to get Thomas's attention, Porno. <laughs> oh, my attention has also been <laughs> Thomas Thomas uh, backed away from the camera. Uh, Daryl leaned in. Go on. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, if, if I'm All you're going to hear in the background is me going. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, and again, this is streaming on Shutter as of the 24th of November, directed by, if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Keola Rosselli, uh, Rosella, excuse me. And it was written by Lawrence uh, Vencielli and Matt Black. This is a first time feature director for uh, Rosella, and it is a first time feature for the writers as well. 
It is a film in which, to put it succinctly, five co-workers at a small town movie theater have to fight off a succubus that they accidentally call forth after playing a reel, an unlabeled reel that they found in a hidden compartment of the movie theater. Hmm. Keep in mind that this is not just small town movie theater. This is apparently a small town Christian town. So uh, one of the characters has just come back from a religious camp. One of them is straight edge. One of them, uh, the guy who runs it is before they start work for the day or the evening, I should say, because it's not a full day shift. But for the evening, they, they gla- uh, grasp hands and do a prayer. Uh, so there is a little bit of that um, religious aspect. Now, there's a lot of interesting elements to the film um, in terms of the concept, in terms of what they set up, because this film takes place in 92. You know that because League of Their Own has opened, as is Encino Man. That's the only two films that they're showing. That's it. And Encino Man came out May of 92, League of Their Own July of 92. So we know it's the summer. We know it's these two films. And when you add those elements with some of the other things that they deal with in terms of sexuality and the way that people look at sex, things get a little complicated with the layering, the, 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 the texture of things in the narrative. Unfortunately, they don't dig into it as much as they could. And they rely on, um, we'll call it, Uh, heavy use of makeup and prosthetics to up the shock value instead of where horror gets really interesting for me anyway is when it's it's trying to explore something and this is more your sort of uh, really don't think about it midnight movie okay there are midnight movies that you that people analyze and people explore this ain't one of those at all at all uh, so if you're just looking for something kind of fun, uh, from the very beginning, the very first shot of the movie, you know what you're in for. Very first shot of the movie. But it's good fun. And if you like uh, Argent- Argento-esque type American movies, there you go. Mm. Daryl just went, mm, you had me a porno, lost me at Argento. Yeah, I just watched The Spirit, so I'm like, eh. Oh, wait, you watched both of them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I still haven't seen the remake. But uh, what'd you think of the first Suspiria? I thought it was okay. I really enjoyed the remake. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I, think I, I can handle on. the violence of the of the remake. Sorry, Thomas. Oh, what was that? Oh, sorry. I was saying I plan on staying far away from both of those. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Get your Italian it, horror on. So. What, what's what's your concern with the original? Well, honestly, I don't know a lot about the original, but I just know the remake is just horrendously freaky and. Uh, is is the original not? Is uh, it is not? No, okay. not not really. It's more uh, like atmospheric. Okay, yeah, very. Right. Yeah. And and on purpose, I was reading about. I first saw Suspiria when it did the 4K restoration roadshow, and it screened at the during the Charlotte Film Festival on the same day that I think yeah on the same day that Adam Adam Fraser's Feral screened in Charlotte, and so I did a double feature with the two. And Feral was much scarier than Suspiria and gorier. With, <laughs> before, before it screened, because of the restoration, I was reading up on it. And to get sort of the atmosphere, the colors for the blood are very vibrant. They're not realistic in the slightest. The violence, when you get it, is a little overdramatic. And there's a lot of use of color and sound to convey meaning so the score by goblin is wonderful i thought it was good the first time the second time i was just in it because i knew what to expect what's really fascinating and i i forget the lead actress's name in in the first one who i believe plays one of the heads of the school in in luca's version of it she's got a passing passing deal but um but she is not exactly a big woman as a young lady. And so Argento had anything she'd interact with made slightly larger so that it sort of amplified the sense that she is small in a world that is too big for her and threatening. 
So there's a lot of those visual elements. It's not an exciting film in the slightest, okay? For the time, it probably was. And you can see where it's really kind of amazing and interesting, looking backward. So I would recommend it at least to have seen it. Right, okay. But, yeah. but beyond that, because there, there's some stuff in porno where you're watching the movie that sort of, as I said, calls forth this, this demon, and it's very Argento. It very much is. I'm sure it's very similar to other directors that, that worked in Giallo, but uh, it, it very much reminded me of that. The dark blacks, the reds and purples, and the imagery lining up over it, sort of the stillness of it all. Anyway, uh, so I'd recommend porno. I would recommend that. Uh, keep your expectations low. You'll have a good time. The other one is a film called Black Bear. Have y'all heard about this film with Aubrey Plaza and Christopher Abbott? Yeah, man, I'm uh, upset that I didn't get to check that out. I think I've heard uh, rumblings, but I haven't. I don't know much beyond that. I wouldn't be surprised if you both hear more about it as we go into award season locally as well as the national and international groups start picking up. Aubrey gives one of the best performances I think I've seen of hers. And this is a film I need to see again to better understand it. Uh, it's directed by Lawrence Michael Levine, who also wrote it. And it's about a woman played by Plaza who goes to a retreat looking for inspiration. What happens after that is two parts of the same story told from different perspectives reimagined in different ways. The old Rashomon, eh? So, not exactly, because it's not like Thomas is going to tell the story from his perspective and you'll tell the story from your perspective. It's literally you watch it play out one way and then the same three actors do it again in it under different circumstances in the same space. Okay. It's very weird. It's very strange. I don't think you can understand it after watching it once. But uh, what... I'm going to screw up the line from Knives Out, but something to the effect of, I don't understand it, but it compels me. But it compels me, though. Yeah, it, <laughs> it makes it makes no damn sense. Compels me, though. But there yeah. you go. That's That describes Black Bear to a T. So if you get the opportunity to check it out, I think it's uh, Select Theaters, December 4th. So if you feel comfortable going to a theater, I don't personally. So I would wait for VOD options if possible. But if you like Aubrey Plaza, if you like a good thriller, if you don't mind things getting a little dark and weird, I recommend it. Sold. I just re-requested that screener. There you go. Do it. It's weird. I look forward to discussing with you. I need people to talk about it with. Yeah. I have questions and I want to get into it, uh, you know, where I don't have to be so secret. So speaking of things that are dark and creepy. Okay. So they're not always dark and creepy. Today's conversation uh, with the time we have is about midnight movies. Okay, and we've talked about movies of this caliber before when we had Adam Frazier on. We discussed cult films. Now, midnight movies aren't always cult films. Midnight movies tend to be those that are not just screened literally at midnight, but tend to be of a low-budget nature. Okay, so just to provide some reference points, we're talking about something like Naked Lunch, I Spit on Your Grave, Heavy Metal, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Of course, The Room has to be mentioned. Eraser Heads, Pink Flamingos, Valley of the Dolls, The Killer Tomatoes movies, Priscilla Queen of the Desert, and of course, Rocky Horror Picture Show. And there's plenty more to choose from from there. Thomas, as our guest, what is your first favorite midnight movie? Sorry, you cut out there. Were you talking to me? Yes, I was. Okay, I'm... all right. Gotcha, gotcha. So, what is your uh, first favorite midnight movie? All right, I have many options here, but uh, I'll throw this one out there just to make sure it fits the criteria. Uh, from Dusk Till Dawn from Robert Rodriguez, is that an acceptable uh, acceptable midnight movie? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I would classify it as a B film. I don't know about low budget. It, I think it was about but 20, I think you could million. count it. All right, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll allow it. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, got to look. Hayek, go for it. <laughs> That's right. Got to love early mid '90s Rodriguez, uh, right when he's finding his voice, and uh, think this one was where he really went full on into the experimental side of his filmmaking. Um, first half of the film was a western, and then the genre shift, just the absolute insane genre shift into a horror vampire type deal. Um, collaborating with Tarantino here on the uh, Tarantino wrote the screenplay, also starred in the film alongside George Clooney. You got 
Harvick, Titel, Juliet Lewis, Salma Hayek, as you mentioned. And um, this is, um, this is, I think, really when um, you saw the team of Rodriguez and Tarantino and what they could do when they're clicking on all cylinders. Uh, they had tried a year before with four rooms and uh, just, it just didn't quite, didn't quite mesh. What? <laughs> Get out. No. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. I don't yeah. think Rubber Rodriguez had anything to do with Get Out, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think you're a little bit off there, Douglas. <laughs> yeah, whatever. But yeah, um, this one is really good one to throw on at midnight. Um, if you uh, you know pop back a pop back a cold one, uh, I'm 21 now, so I can say that. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's just a really fun time. Um, I I think um, Clooney and Tarantino have a very interesting dynamic as the uh, two brothers in this film. Uh, Tarantino's character is just an absolutely vile and despicable character. And Clooney is still a pretty, pretty messed up guy as well, but he almost brings a sort of balance to him because he has some semblance of a code of honor, which, which has always intrigued me. Um, and um, then let's see, I don't think I have too much more to add about this one, but uh, if y'all want to, I can certainly say that learning about Tarantino's foot thing, which I wasn't aware of when I saw this in high school, I I knew that Tarantino was, he wrote the screenplay for it. And so I knew about that long time ago, but finding out about it over the last year or two, I rewatched from from dusk till dawn. Yeah, Daryl, I didn't know, Mm. but he's like, oh, how could you not know? <laughs> yeah, I don't that's know. my first thought. How could you not know? That's but that's... when you re I rewatched from Dust Till Dawn after seeing um, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and there's that scene with Sama Hayek mm. pouring the beer down her foot, and I was like, no wonder you wrote the screenplay. Come yeah. on, mm-hmm. yeah, creepy nonsense there. Anyway, speaking of creepy nonsense, Daryl, what's your what's your first one? Um, Dust Till Dawn uh, is. It's still young, fresh-faced Clooney, and I, I love it. They give him so many great one-liners all throughout that. And uh, also, it's one of my favorite Harvey Keitel performances because it's a little bit different than what I've seen him in besides that. I've seen him in, as a, you know, a, a hard case in a lot of movies, but this is, uh, you know, just father figure trying to protect his family. First thing I saw Juliet Lewis in, and I was like, ah, who's this to keep an eye on? And then I dipped. Oh. <laughs> Uh, my first joint, man, if I'm going to watch, I approach this as if I owned a theater and I'm like, hey, people, come watch a midnight movie. Uh, here's three options that I would give them. The first one, the reason I'll allow from Dust Till Dawn is my first one is Machete. Okay. Yeah. Machete. Yeah. Machete. A machete don't text. And if you <laughs> learn nothing else about, about the Machete in this movie, it's Machete don't text until he does. Uh, it's It's, you know, coming off the the grindhouse fake trailers that uh, Rodriguez and Tarantino did together. This was the one that got the, the, you know, the most buzz, the most reception talking about it. And people are like, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that as a, as a, you know, a campy B movie. And they lean full into that campy B moviness, but even still, it's just a fun, a fun movie. It's still a well done fun movie, man. Um, you get, Wow, I just blanked on her name, Michelle Rodriguez, and there Jessica Alba in there. Jeff Leahy is here as your bad guy. Lindsay it's, Lohan. Lindsay Lohan is in there as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a strange relationship there. Mm. Uh, it's great. It's fun. It's schlocky. It's goofy. It makes no sense. It's funny. Uh, it's well done all at the same time. And uh, while its sequel is nowhere near as competent, or as well done, I will give a sequel props for giving us a fake trailer that we did not realize will be a fake trailer for Machete 3. And so you see it at the very end of Machete 2, you realize that fake trailer you saw at the beginning sets up everything uh, at the end of that movie. Geniusly done. Machete in space. It's it's brilliantly done. I wish the rest of the movie had been brilliantly done. But that first Machete... uh, holds a special place in my heart for just the absolute amount of ridiculous fun that it is. Right on, right on. And you, sir, what is your first? Well, my first one I've talked about a bunch, so I'm not going to get into before. It was my number two when we talked about cult films. And when it comes to midnight movies, it is top tier for me. 
it's the Rocky Horror Picture Show. This is a movie that uh, I've probably, if I, my memory serves correctly, the first time I ever watched this, FX was still a brand new channel. They were showing The Greatest American Hero and Green Hornet and Wonder Woman and all that other stuff. And it was Halloween night and my friends were out and I didn't know where anybody was and wasn't going out anywhere. And I put on the TV and there's the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And that's how I spent my Halloween that year. And it, it, I ran it when I was in college for all four years. I'm a card carrying member of the fan club. We did the time warp at my wedding. So uh, there's just, I've spoken about this movie at length. So I'm just going to leave it with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. All right. Thomas, all right. what is your number two? All right. I'm going to go with uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Uh, <laughs> this, this, um, Why do these kids keep killing themselves? <laughs> Yeah, so it was actually premiered at Sundance in January of 2010 and was also showed at uh, South by Southwest in March of that year, but didn't get a theatrical distribution until September of 2011. And uh, even then, it only grossed it's like $5.7 million against a $5 million budget. Uh, but it really found its following on Blu-ray and streaming, Netflix. Um, you have, it's directed by Eli Craig and it has stars Alan Tudyk and uh, Tyler Labine. A uh, great parody and satire of all the horror movies and slashers of the 80s, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween. Um, and it's one of those where it's hard to catch a breath because you were laughing so hard at the um, just the way it's able to make something so brutal, brutal and grotesque so hilarious is uh, something that I thoroughly appreciate. Um, and, of course, someone with a very dark sense of humor uh, as myself. Uh, this is this perfectly fits for what I'm going for. Um, just the way they play on all the situations and the stereotypes of the hillbillies in the woods and just make them as the most lovable, harmless characters, but still finding themselves in such horrible situations and painted as these murderers. Um, it's, it's, it's hard not to fall in love with everything about this movie. Um, I think I, I think the first time I watched this, I was just scrolling through Netflix at like one AM or something. And it I came across it. And I was like, I don't I don't know a ton about this, but I'm just gonna check it out. And uh next day I was telling Noel about it. And he was like, Oh yeah, that's that's one of my favorite uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was holding out on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um I definitely Tucker and Dale versus Evil is pretty high up there for me on my list of midnight movies. Right on, right on. Right on. Excellent. Well done. Uh, my number two, I'm going to get to, just in case Douglas has it, I can steal it from him. Uh, the Evil Dead. Nope. Okay, good. Uh, I mean, yeah, when you, if you want to get together, you, you want to get together and have some fun, man. This is this is an ideal midnight setup. You, you get a couple of your Evil Dead friends together you watch one and two and if you can army of darkness and you just sit back and enjoy it i think this is that is that whole trilogy is made for midnight watching yeah i think uh it just got that vibe that camp and it's just it's fun it's quotable it's funny it's still got a little bit of a little bit of tension and scariness in there at times um and you can just enjoy the ride from the first movie all the way through the third movie and just see how Sam, Ra- Sam Raimi's budget increased from movie to movie to movie and what he does and his inventiveness and how he how he chooses to use those effects in movies and get the Jason and the Argonauts like creatures out there. You, the stop motion. The, the stop motion, yeah. It's fun. It's just a good fun ride. I mean, there's not a whole lot to say about the that is it's it's what brings Bruce Campbell to the world, right? So we, we got an absolute gem of a human being out of this series. It's it's Evil Dead. You know what it is. Doug, what's up? Oh, uh, no, I have nothing else to add other than Dead by Dawn. Dead, <laughs> by, Dead Dawn. by Dawn. <laughs> I swallow your soul. I swallow your soul. <laughs> Grandma. Grandma, are you okay? <laughs> All I see are these trees. No, seriously, though, if uh, that last one was not a quote from Evil Dead, it was, however, a quote from Evil Dead the Musical. And mm. if you have not experienced Evil Dead the Musical, Track it down when live shows can happen again. I've seen it twice. It is hilarious. We listen to the soundtrack. Go check it out. All right. Bobby Joe. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, good Lord. You haven't lived until you've heard a tango called What the Fuck Was That? Anyway, <laughs> um, so let's see. My number two is a film I don't think I've talked about on here, but it's funny because Thomas mentioned Clooney and brought that up. I'm going to go back into, into Clooney's history and bring up Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Mm. I think I saw that on one of like... USA's up all night type of type oh, of programming man. when I they would literally phrase. do midnight movies. Yeah. And these <laughs> this movie is so stupid and yet so wonderful. My favorite moment in this film, and the reason why I'm including it on here, is there's a moment in the film where everything stops, the cast breaks character. And they start talking about how they have no more budget to finish the movie. And Clooney's like, hold on, I've got a minute. I've got an idea. He runs off. And then the movie picks back up again. And they're sitting down. And he's drinking a Pepsi. And he's like, organized the can in a way. <laughs> they start having this conversation about product placement. And it's just, it's, it's that kind of movie. It is straight up, you don't think, you don't wonder. It's how can we get creative using as little as possible? Mm-hmm. And I mean, they turn a pineapple into a woman, which I can only think is uh, not a pineapple, uh, a tomato into a woman, which is probably where the whole female Martian idea came from in Mars Attacks. It's the only mm. thing I can think of. But this film is absolutely ridiculous and it doesn't try to be anything other than a throwback to the 50s and 60s, that nuclear age of, of horror films like The Blob and, and uh, the space films that would come out, Godzilla. Because it's, it's just using science and being like, we're going to make Cindy and Tomatoes. And you go, sure. sure. And you buy a ticket. <laughs> so uh, there's really nothing else to say because it's just the return of the killer tomatoes. Good luck. Make catch up. I don't know. Okay. Thomas? What you got? What's your last? Uh, yeah, so I actually hadn't even thought about this connection as I drew together my list, but this is my second uh, vampire film on my list. Uh, what We Do in the Shadows from mm. 2014. Still haven't seen it. <laughs> written oh, directed, it's so good. Yeah, yeah. Written and directed by Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi. Also, they star in the lead roles. And it's basically a combination of a pseudo-documentary as well as a 90s sitcom um, akin to Friends, and I know Daryl is not a huge fan of Friends whatsoever. This kind of takes anything that is that you might find positive about Friends and applies it. And you think know, Living builds. Single, not Friends. Yeah. Think Living Single. Hey, there we go. That, that's, that's now more, we're talking. It's more like yeah. it. More you like mean the show um, Friends ripped off of. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> um, you know, a group of flatmates in um, Australia in like you know twenties, twenty first century Australia, and they happen to be vampires. And uh, some of them have been vampires for thousands of years. Some of them for a couple decades. Some of them are just newly vampires. And they just have to go about finding a way to cope with the struggles of daily life. Uh, because being a human is hard enough. And being a vampire might even be a little bit more difficult. As you see, uh, all the struggles, whether it be mental or emotional, physical. And um, I've always appreciated when a uh, film is able to uh, examine some of the deepest philosophies of the human existence through such a comedic lens. And I think this one does that in a fantastic way. Um, why Titi's uh, form of comedic, comedic delivery is just outstanding. And uh, I think he really settles into his voice with this film. Uh, I actually just watched it for the first time a couple weeks ago, like around Halloween. And a friend introduced me to it and just fell head over heels for it. Um, and the Australian setting, I very much enjoy that. Um, and coming from my outside perspective as a stupid American. Uh, <laughs> see, Is there any other kind? Uh, not really. I thought he was going to say an outside experience of not being a vampire. <laughs> well, I mean, that too. But I, it kind of depends on who you ask, though. Some people might categorize me as a vampire. So, you, you are but, tweeting at odd hours. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, but I just, you know, I love pretty much everything about this film. Um, on a $1.6 million budget, um, the old school practical effects are, um, they are something to behold. Um, so got to love what we do in the shadows. And I would 
highly recommend it to anybody out there that has not gotten a chance to see it as of yet. All um, right. I haven't watched the TV show, but by sheer virtue of them making that movie, they gave us the most glorious vampire council meeting in the TV show where they literally got Tilda Swinton showed up as her character from Only Lovers Left Alive. Pee Wee Herman, I think, showed up as his character from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. Uh, Wesley Snipes, I think, appears briefly as Blade, or is at least mentioned. Like, they brought in all of these actors to be part of the Vampire Council that had been vampires. And giving us that is worth it enough. Uh, Also, Daryl, just in a visual gag no one else will get, I just want you to remember, I'll be there for you. Oh, Jesus Christ. When the rain, <laughs> when the rain starts oh, to fall. Oh, well. Mm. It may not right, be then your then. week, your day, or your year, but I'll be there for you. Oh, yeah, I, I'm holding up a photo, by the way, that Daryl took of me on the WB studio set, me sitting on the friend's couch. So Daryl's been close. Daryl's been close. It's not the actual couch, but close enough. Mm-hmm. The greasiest yeah. I've felt all year. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your number two, sir? Uh, my number three. You're number three. That's right. Yes, my that, third I'm, one, man. I'm uh, sticking in the world of uh, of Bruce Campbell, and I don't think it gets any more midnight than Bubba Hotep. Right on. I thought uh, you were going to go with my name is Bruce, but all right. No, nah, man. Bubba Hotep. Uh, directed, produced, written by Don Cossarelli. Uh, <laughs> a comedy horror, uh, much in the same vein as as Evil Dead is. Uh, two dudes in a nursing home where, you know, we have zombies trying to take over. And no one's believing these guys because they're two dudes in a nursing home. One of them uh, being Ossie Davis, a black man who thinks he's John F. Kennedy, uh, patched up after his assassination attempt. Uh, I don't think that's actually ever verified or not in the movie. <laughs> but, but, but that's what he thinks. <laughs> I took a sip of water and he goes, I don't think that's ever been verified. <laughs> Until he said, in the movie. I was like, Do you uh, think it was a documentary? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a weird little joint, man. I had a friend tell me about it. Yeah, like right when it first came out, maybe. I checked it out like 03, 04, something like that. And it's just, it's weird. It's funny. It's eclectic, and you just have what if? And oh, and you, know, you talk about Ossie Davis is a black man thing, and he's JFK. Bruce Campbell is an old man who's trying to tell people that he is actually Elvis Presley, as well. Uh, so you have that whole thing going for you as well. And how do these just two halfway immobilized old farts gonna gonna stop you know mummies from coming back and and taking over things? It's just fun to see it's got a little bit of heart to it it's just nice that you talk about kicking open a couple of old ones cold ones i think this is cold ones for the old ones is what i'm gonna call this movie <laughs> uh it's it's fun it's fun and it's quick at 92 minutes man you get in there you watch it and you get out and you have yourself a fun time bubba hotep if you've never seen i'm not sure if it's streaming anywhere it's not exactly all that popular but it's still one that i i would encourage people if you're if you're into some some weird off kilter type movies and you're looking for something kind of off that beaten path, it's worth checking out. Right on, right on. It's, I haven't seen it in literal decades. I was living in Charlotte, I think working my full-time gig. Crystal may have been living with me at the time or may not have. I can't remember if we were dating yet because she would come to visit. Um, that's how long it's been. You, you live in Charlotte now. Yeah, but I left Charlotte to go to graduate school. Oh, okay. And back. That makes more sense. So, yeah. Wow, so it's, it's been, been a while. Decades. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it hasn't even been a cup of coffee. It <laughs> hasn't been a minute. Yeah, it hasn't it's been, been a minute. A, it's, been a, it's been some years. Uh, but I do agree. I mean, I'm a Bruce Campbell fan, so uh, I have to say you should watch it simply to support the man mm-hmm. to, make him to make more movies. Doesn't have to be Ash anymore. We just want him to make more movies. Or at uh, least just put him somewhere in the next Tom Holland Spider-Man movie, please. Yes. It's no, it's gonna it, or put him in Doctor Holland Strange. Spider Man, it's gonna be Doctor Strange because Sam Raimi is directing, therefore, by rule, <laughs> Bruce Campbell has to show up. For example, uh it w- it didn't make my list. Uh, I don't think it quite qualifies, but Dark Man, a Sam Raimi movie, has Bruce Campbell at the very, very end. I don't see why that wouldn't qualify. Well, uh, it's less low budget. Mm, less okay. Low budget. That's fair. I need Bruce Campbell to show up as an alternate dimension Spider-Man. 
He was supposed to be Mysterio in uh, the original Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, I believe. That's right. Uh, yeah. I would have bought that. I would have yeah. bought that. Entirely. I would have bought it heavy, yeah. I mean, because I think his cameo across all three movies was supposed to be Mysterio, and then the fourth movie was supposed to be a Sinister Six type deal. So. Oh, so they were backdoor setting him up as yeah, Mysterio yeah. this yeah. whole time? Huh. Okay. Interesting. He was just a shitty waiter and was He's like, I'll get into magic. A shitty waiter, or he was a shitty uh, theater ticket attendant there. And then, Spider-Man a, and, then a, and then a boxer announcer, like, He's really trying to make it work. He's got the hustle on in New York. But, I mean, how else are you going to make anything happening? Unless ah. you got hustle? Speaking of hustling, my last one. Now, with all of these films, there's, like with any film that I choose, there's always some connection or reason that it resonates with me. So this one, I don't know if you guys have seen it. Have you all seen a 1980 movie called Midnight Madness? Mm-mm. Okay. I'm not, no. Uh, directed by Michael Nankin and David Wetcher. These guys, they also wrote it, and these guys have gone on to direct some, a lot of TV shows and stuff that you might have watched, The Flash 100, stuff like that. This movie, if I recall correctly, is uh, Michael J. Fox's first film. No. Right? This movie is super, super dumb. <laughs> super dumb. The premise of it is that a bunch of college kids split up into, I think it's five groups, each with a different co- color, and they go on a scavenger hunt throughout town. And so there's this popular college kid who's organized all of this, and every color has a different designation, if you will. And so as usual, you've got each group is split up into various stereotypes. So the nerds are all in one group, the jocks are all in one group, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's our one regular group, if you will, that we're following. And they end up at one point, they solve a clue and they end up at a Pabst Blue Ribbon Brewery, Ooh. like the bottling plant. Yeah. One of the, one of the um, jocks falls into it and drinks his way through so he can get out of the thing he's fallen into where they were mixing beer. Because, you know, like you do. <laughs> but this movie, I mean, again, it's not great. It's very much of the time. It's, it's the perfect kind of midnight movie where the consequences, the, the stakes are incredibly low. It's stupid. It's silly. It's probably wrong in so many different ways. I personally haven't watched it in years, so I can't speak to any sort of awfulness that may be present in it that I didn't notice that as a kid. But it's because of this movie that Crystal and I had a scavenger hunt the night before our wedding. We literally had our rehearsal dinner. Uh, everybody, we... we got pizza and we did some other stuff with with our family and friends and then my middle brother had set it up with local businesses throughout my hometown of Roanoke Virginia where people could go and there would be a riddle and you had to do a thing and provide proof before you could go on to the next station so that was what we did the night before our wedding all thanks to Midnight Madness there you go it was amazing it was amazing and my dad personally loved it because my middle brother on purpose set it up so that one of your missions was to go to a local coffee shop where you had to buy a specific treat and then give it to my dad who was stationed somewhere else in order to get the clue for the next thing. So my dad was like, free cookies? Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Midnight, Midnight Madness is my last one. Right on. All right on. It's a good list, fellas. Good lists. You know, and and uh, anytime people talk about Tucker and Dale versus Evil, I'm always like, it, it just didn't connect with me the first time, but I keep feeling like I should go back and revisit it. Crystal loves it and always watches it when I'm not around, which I think is mean. Oh, you have to. Yeah, yeah. She's still mean. Thank you for agreeing <laughs> with me, Thomas. Thank you for agreeing uh, with me. You said that she has to watch it without me. You're mean, too. I was saying, I was saying you have to go back and watch it. But, <laughs> sure, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll play back the tape. We'll see what we're agreeing to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, um, this, is, this has run a little longer, I think, than we intended. Sorry for taking up so much of your, of your time, sir. We know that your time is precious. You, you got a lot of hustle going on. You got papers to write. I know you need to get to them. You got deals to make to get us those DVDs. I'm looking for a Blu-ray quality. Doesn't have to be 4K. I want some Blu-ray quality dancing bulldogs to show up at my house. Right on, right on. I'm checking my mail every day for the rest of the year. That's what I'll I'm saying. See, see when that comes in. 
Yeah, I'll yeah, see what I, I can do. Yeah. And and it better not show up USPS. No, 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 no. I want like signed, certified FedEx, DHL. Give me like UPS. Mm-hmm. Make it something official, right? I want a certificate of authenticity on gold foil. I want to feel like I'm about to win a trip to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory before I watch your movie. Sign, seal, deliver. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we want, man. All right, well, I'll give, uh, I'll give Christian a call right after this and uh, get back to you with the details. Dealing and dealing, man. In, in the meantime, where again can people watch The Dancing Bulldogs? Just go if, to YouTube. If I get impatient, yeah. if I yeah. get impatient, where do I go? Just go to YouTube and search The Dancing Bulldogs, and it should be the first thing that pops up. But that is Dancing, uh, D-A-N-C-I-N apostrophe. No G, because if you type in a G, Dancing Bulldogs, then you'll actually get videos of bulldogs that are dancing. This so is, it's win-win, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, if you, want, if you want to actually watch our documentary, then <laughs> leave out the G and put the apostrophe. Um, but, what you if know, I want to do both? What if I want to watch the documentary and Dancing Bulldogs? You got to pull up Internet Explorer and Chrome and just have yeah, them side yeah. by side. There you go. That's the way to do it. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it's an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, shouldn't take too much of your time, but um, it's I think it would be time well spent for a Saturday afternoon or any any free time you find. We would greatly appreciate the uh, support. Boom, As there you the go. Ex- executive producer of the movie, he thinks your time would be best spent watching his film. <laughs> that is an unbiased opinion if I ever heard one. <laughs> it is indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be eagerly awaiting your review. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and check that out, peoples. If you uh, if you get a chance, you got a little bit of spare time. Like I said, I highly enjoyed it. And if you're a fan of sports of any kind or just you'd like a good underdog story, I think it's well worth your time. Right on, right on. Where can people find you, Sir Thomas? Uh, let's see. I am a, well, a contributor to Elements of Madness. Uh, I also write on my own site, um, the rundown on movies.com. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at T underscore cube underscore Manning. And oh, also meet me in the movies. I kind of forget about that show as well. Uh, meet me in the movies. On- small, small TV <laughs> show you've done from time to time. Yeah. C19 dot TV or, um, just on channel 19 in, uh, the Shelby, North Carolina area on spectrum cable. If you have that. So yeah, that, that's where I am. And which of your 15 Instagram accounts should they follow if they want to find you there? Uh, let's see. Hold up. Uh, Thomas underscore Manning underscore movies. We'll go there. Yeah. Okay. Boom. Done and done. Just yeah. checking. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this, what ended up being an extra long episode. Our, our guests so far have had so much wonderful things to say that we just, we just keep over overrunning. But, oh. you know. It ain't too bad. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to see you again, even though it's been some months since we've laid eyes. It's great. You look yeah. good. I'm it's trying. Sandwich. Yeah, I don't I'm know. trying to hang in there. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I really do appreciate the invitation. It's always a privilege to speak with you guys. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again sometime. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. Uh, that will happen. If, and if not on this show, whatever the secret show you guys have going on, I'm, I'm sure we'll be doing it. Hey, don't, you, don't you worry about that, Doug. Maybe, maybe if uh, you I don't build... worry about it, Daryl. <laughs> I don't worry about it. Maybe if uh, you build up enough of a portfolio, we'll actually bring you on as a special guest on that oh, show. That's a great yeah. idea, yeah. Thomas. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Ah, oh, that hurt. Oh. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, that's it for this episode of the Cinnamon. Uh, on behalf of the always effervescent Doug Davison and our guest, Thomas Manning, thanks a lot. And we will check you out possibly in yet another two weeks right here on the Cinnamon. What? Yep. What? Wait, with yep. Thomas? No, with you. Oh, okay. I was like, wait, you didn't tell me about that. No! <laughs> <laughs>